if you saw what this meant to my daughter who's deaf and to see a deaf protagonist every week who's pretty and cool and flawed and it has changed her perception of herself. Honestly, that's where I feel like I've done good. You're listening to The Other 50%, a history of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the show where we hold the space for successful women in Hollywood to tell their stories. This week, I got to speak with Lizzie Weiss. Lizzie Weiss is a writer, and she wrote the movie Blue Crush, and she's the creator and showrunner of Switched at Birth, a show we love at my house, and a show that has won a Gracie Award and a Peabody Award. It's really something special. Lizzie has sold about, give or take, a million pilots while running a show, while raising a family. Here, have a listen. What do you do? I'm a TV writer and a showrunner, I guess. Now I'm a showrunner since I've run a show. <laughs> Switched at Birth is your show. Yes. Is that the first time you've been a showrunner? Yes. I want to circle back to that for sure because my family are big fans. But how did you how did you get there? How did you start? How did I start? Um, I was always a writer growing up, so I think it was just a matter of what, you know, sort of capacity. And just because I, you know, it's what I did well in in school and I got A's. And so I think I just sort of continued on the path of, oh, I'll be a professor. Mm-hmm. And so I went um, to NYU for a program called Cinema Studies because I loved film. Did you I go went there to too? NYU too. Oh, my God. For graduate school? No. Okay. Undergrad. I actually didn't like it, so maybe we will differ there. It wasn't right for me. Um, first of all, I really, well, of course it was in New York City, which was great, but it was so sprawling. It was yeah. it was hard for a graduate program. I think I had understood that graduate programs would be even more intimate and one-on-one, but it felt kind of broad. Um, and I just, the program and I didn't connect. It was um, very esoteric. Mm. And especially at that time in the early 90s, and I really want to talk about, you know, Thelma Louise and Titanic and all these big mainstream movies, and it was more on the Andy Warhol, you know, the history of yeah. cinema, and I, I just realized, oh, this is not what I'm interested in. I want to be writing. So I left, um, and I started taking classes um, by myself, and it's, it's funny because this was now 20 years ago. I took the Robert McKee class that no one had ever heard of. And it was like $600, and I volunteered to check people in, and so I got to do it for like $100. There's all these <laughs> fun ways to do it. I took this thing called Writer's Boot Camp, which is a six-weeks class that I really, really liked. And I just kind of taught myself with all that. I would literally watch um, TV dramas that I liked, which mm-hmm. were at the time My So-Called Life, Party of Five, um, and I would take a pen and paper and write down how many scenes before the teaser and how many scenes till Act One, and... I just kind of so taught, you taught, taught yourself myself. the format. I, I taught myself, and I was making a living. By then, I had I was done with school, and I became a freelance business writer, which basically meant I went wrote really boring things for like money. technical manuals, pretty much um, yeah. grants for hire. I wrote speeches, and uh, then what I kind had, of speeches were you writing? So I was working with a guy who owned a healthcare consulting firm, and he would. Row sounds like a party, but he would arrange these conferences for pharmaceutical companies like Shearing Plow, and they invite all of their pharmacists from all over the country to come. And I would, you know, write the speech for the CEO or write all <laughs> of the materials. And I'd go to the, you know, weekend, and um, it was really a passion project for you. <laughs> exactly, it was the passion to make, you know, five grand or something, um, just enough to, you know, pay for my eight hundred dollar a month Jane Street. Loft, which Aww. now, of course, is like $4,000. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I had a boyfriend at the time who was at Stanford PhD program, so I moved to be with him to Stanford. And then after about a year, that was the beginning of like Silicon Valley, which I did not connect with in any way. And then I moved back to LA because, oh, here's where we get back in. Um, I applied really randomly to an AFI program that I saw on some bulletin board. And it was a TV writer's workshop, and you had to turn in a one-hour TV sample. And I was selected with nine others, and um, it was pretty great. They put on your a reading of your show. Great. Yeah, with real actors, and they matched you with a real, you know, TV writer producer who would both, you know, critique it. And then you could ask questions, and I remember... What was so great about it, because remember, I didn't, I didn't go to you know, graduate school for writing. You could ask things like, what do you wear to a meeting? Yeah. Which is just a great question. Like, like practical advice. Practical How advice. How do you get the job? Just stuff that, yeah, you know, how do you 
And I remember them saying, like, don't compete with the executives. You don't have to dress corporate. You're the artist. Be the artist. You know, stuff like that. Um, and then I moved back to L.A. where I'm from. And I was lucky because I could live in back of my old bedroom for free. <laughs> and while I – so I, I was fluent in Spanish. And they were literally um, giving out classrooms, bilingual classrooms. It sounds incredible today. But there were so, it was so much overcrowded – kids um that pete wilson was the governor and they were basically it was called emergency credentialing so i was given an emergency credential without going to school to be a teacher and to they, teach to give me they gave me a bilingual kindergarten classroom like overnight that's true yeah so you became a kindergarten teacher yes i was a bilingual kindergarten teacher for a year and i thought that i would be able to you know write at night and it was... Oh, because kindergarten's so easy. <laughs> not, I mean, what did I know? I didn't know anything about kids. And also, it was a population that they needed a lot of support. You know, yeah. there were kids going back and forth to Mexico a lot, and then they'd be gone for weeks because they'd have, you know, family situations. And they drew me in, and I loved them. Um, but I, I finished out the year, of course. But I, I realized after one year, this is... Because I'm not... It's not fair. My passion is not to be a teacher. Yeah. It's not something you should or can do half-time. So I became a substitute teacher which was a great gig for um, aspiring writers because you can call the night before. This is, of course, before the internet. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, you left a message on this machine. I did it for LA Unified and for Beverly Hills. And you'd say, I want to work tomorrow or I don't want to work tomorrow. And they would call you at 5 or 6 in the morning. And they would. Uh, this woman would say, your assignment is, and here's your grade and school. So it's a great day job. It's a great day job because, first of all, you show up. There's a plan. You walk out at three. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to grade or plan for tomorrow. And as I said, I could take a day off. So I would do it three or four days a week. Um, and I would write on the one or two other days. There were a lot of aspiring actors who did it. I'm assuming it's still a, a gig out there for people. But, well, there's um, still substitutes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and I did Beverly Hills because it was closer and they paid like a few dollars more. Yeah. <laughs> so were you doing spec writing at night or were you getting writing jobs? When um, this was happening? I was doing spec writing. I was constantly writing. And um, my first job, so, you know, here's what happened. I got an agent, which is huge. How'd you get I got an agent because, um, well, the guy who became my husband, but who was just my boyfriend at the time, he just was friends with a guy who um, had an agent and I had to, you know, it was it was tricky back then. I had to, you know, hey, if you're comfortable, would you mind reading this party of five spec of mine? Mm. And if you feel confident, you know, will you submit it and say you support me? And this guy did it. And that I was nice. signed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's my agent and I joke about it because I think I'm, like, we win the prize for... We've been together. I've never switched agents. Same agent? The Same agent time. for 20 years. I was apparently his first... I was his first you know, ever baby drama writer, wow. which I didn't know. I didn't care. He was, you know, my age. He'd just been promoted um, to agent from assistant. His name is Larry Sauls, and we're still working together 20 years later. Well, that's um, so that was my first oh, huge just breakthrough. Yeah. And what was funny was um, they said, okay, well, you know, do you want to feature agent two? And I was like, yeah, here. And I gave them like a pile of like eight features I had read. And, you know, I, I just, I had continued to write just to practice. Yeah. So you're I doing got a words you're ready. You had a pile. A ton. A ton. I was always I was a yeah, a self motivated, you know, figured out. And so I got this job on MTV called Undressed, which was this delightful little show about sex. <laughs> and really? yeah, it was actually super fun. Um it was a guy named Roland Joffe created it, who's this sort of fancy, I think, British director. And um it was kind of like boot camp because, first of all, it was super, super cheap, and um, which is great because it teaches you, okay, you have one, you know, dorm room and two actors. It's almost like playwriting. Yeah. And you needed huge act outs, and it was just coming every day with five pitches, and it was just really fun. We were all really young. You know, every So Sunday, that was your graduate school. That was my graduate school. That's right. And everyone in that is like a showrunner today. Wow. You know, Steve Denight, Damon, Damon Lindelof, Jennifer Johnson. We all kind of started off together in our 20s writing these ridiculous sex shows. But it was, as I said, it was really fun. And um, I got Blue Crush while I was there. Which is incredible today because, well, it was just a different time. 
you know. So the way I got Blue Crush was I had written a spec um, that was loosely based on the Stanford Prison Experiment. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that? The and I made it um, all girls boarding school in the fifties. So very different, oh. just kind of right yeah. inspired by. And it got me like eighteen generals, which is of course the the agent always wants to send you out on all these general meetings, right? Like, oh, we're not going to buy it, but interesting new young female voice. Let's meet her. We want to meet you, yeah. So I had, I think it was literally eighteen of those, and it's my was my first meet and greet experience. And you know, lucky enough, um, two of these women producers. Um, Buffy Shutt and Kathy Jones uh, had this article um, from Outside Magazine written by Susan Orlean and it was about these girls and there was no story. It was just this beautiful slice of life about their lives, these four girls who lived um, and lived to surf. And uh, they said, well, you wrote a women coming of age story. Maybe you want to pitch on this. And I just won the pitch, you know, the bake off. Hmm. Um, I think I was like, you know, I was in my 20s. It's incredible. And it became it became Blue Crush. So... I quit um, undressed, and then I started doing the feature stuff for a while. So then, how long were you doing that before you went back? Um, to Blue Crush took a long time. Movies take a really long time, mm-hmm. and um, I did a rewrite on a movie um, with this director who ended up then deciding to direct Blue Crush. He was a surfer, John Stockwell. And he decided to jump on that project. And um, it went through many, many incarnations. That's sort of the the deal, of course. It started off, when they first hired me, they wanted Mystic Pizza, if you remember that. Of course I remember that. And uh, it was just a sweet movie. So it was smaller and more intimate and more female. And then John came on board and said, you know, look, Fast and the Furious just came out. You guys just did that. It was a universal movie. And it was more, you know, boyish and adrenaline. Action. Action. So we did a draft that was, like, super that. And it was, like, big wave surfing. And I felt like we'd kind of lost the soul. And I was like, you know, I think we we need to go back to sort of a middle ground. And so then John and I found this, I think, you know, great middle ground that became Blue Crush. Um, So he listened to you when you said that? um, He did, actually. He did. That was a conversation because I was saying something sort of just between, you know, like not in a meeting with our people. I was like, I feel like, you know, and just like anyone, you can lose what you originally wanted to do by taking so many notes. And then you haven't stood back and go, wait a minute, is this what I love about surfing? We've lost the soul of it. Mm-hmm. It was just adrenaline big, you know. Um, yeah, he did. Um, so that was a bunch of years of my life. And then I... I guess I could say I was off and running, but I wasn't. I mean, there was a lull. That you know, that was sort of my first experience of of the roller coaster. Now, was there a writer's room for that, or no. were you just working on the script? No, Blue Crush by yourself. I wrote a bunch of drafts by myself. John was hired to direct it. He's also a writer, so then we did a bunch of drafts together. Mm-hmm. It was just he and I. Um, and it was a very loose process. We'd just talk on the phone. We'd meet. I would mostly write stuff, submit it to him. He'd give me notes. I would try it again. He was very much like, he became leading the charge. He was older than me. He was the director. It was a, just, a, it was an experience of, I became, you know, sort of his writer. Yeah. And that's okay. That's part of the process. But it? then does that take you out of the loop of oh. who's being seen and who's being talked to? And Oh, for other jobs? Yeah. Um, well, as I said, I had done a rewrite on a movie. And off of that, I got my first pilot. So I started doing TV. Okay. And again, I was young. I was in my 20s, which I didn't realize it, but I started selling a pilot every year. In your 20s? Yeah. And did you think that was a big deal? No, I didn't, I guess. <laughs> That's now, just how it I, I mean, now I realize it because I see that it's harder, but I, I, I did. I had a, you know, I somehow got in. And so I had, I mean, I truly have lost count, which is why the number changes, but I, I had like, I sold like 17 pilots before wow. Switch to Birth went on the air. We made one. John and I made a Blue Crush like pilot called Rocky Point. Um, so we did make one in Hawaii, but the, all the other ones just were passed on. But it was, you know, it was a way of every year not only making a living, but breaking story and thinking yeah. about a Bible for the show and characters. And so it kept me. You know, was sharp. your first um, scripted to, after the MTV? Yeah. Was your next TV job as a showrunner? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> That's funny. I had one job. Um, yeah, I went. It, it is. Wow. A, it is a strange path. Um, I got pregnant, and my husband was like, "Why don't you just go on someone else's show? You, every year you do this. 
what do you see what that experience is like? And so I did. <laughs> and it was not a great experience. Hmm. It Look, every room is different. It was just a, not a room that I enjoyed for a variety of reasons. Um, there were some issues with the way it... And so what I, to be honest, what I learned was stuff I, I didn't want to do. Right. Yeah. How you wanted to make your room. Yeah. And uh, the writer's strike happened. Hey. Which was great. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was seven months pregnant when we struck. Oh, so the timing was perfect It was perfect. It was totally perfect. <laughs> and then we ended the strike in January right when my son was born. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done of being on shows in which it, there's going to be a toxic environment. And then, yeah. Well, the funny story about Switched is, so I, I sold a bunch more um, every year. And I was trying to kind of keep a foot in both worlds and features. But features had kind of disintegrated. Yeah. The business, and it, I didn't realize that it wasn't personal. So after Blue Crush, I pitched on like, you know, 10 movies a year and they wouldn't go because, oh, we decided not to do it or we decided um, to go with someone else or we're not doing it at all. I mean, and it was, I thought it was just me and I didn't realize, no, no, the whole industry is changing. Yeah. They're not doing movies anymore. Like, the, you know, they're all these big four quadrant and... They're not doing 20 to $40 million movies at all. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So I, I just didn't know. Oh, and you know how it is. You take it personally and you think, what's oh, wrong sure. with me? Why can't I get my footing, you know? And you have a bazillion ideas. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that's why TV was great, actually, because I was I was still selling TV, even yeah. though I was floundering majorly in features. Um, but then, of course, what happened was, I really don't watch movies anymore. I only watch TV show, mm. and you just realize it's sort of sad, because the experience of going to the movies as a writer and thinking, oh, I wish I'd written that, or it inspires me to write again, is a great one, and I haven't had that very much lately. Because it's all superhero it's movies all, with yeah, no plot. Yeah. So that's that's a bummer about that. But anyway, yeah. so... Oh, Switched. So the funny thing about Switched was um, I loved this idea. And my agent said, you have one shot, one kill. The only place who will hear it is ABC Family. CW wouldn't hear it, even though I had just sold to them the year before. So they knew me. They were just like, we're just not doing anything that's not whatever it was. I can't remember if it was... New York, or, or we're not doing teen. I think it was the teen of it. It is so unique, that show. Thank you. So unique. Like, How did you even get the idea? Uh, this American Life. Oh, really? Yeah. I love that show. Yeah. There was an amazing This American Life. Um, I remember everything. I was pregnant again, second time. Um, and I used to do yoga at home. I would just do yoga uh -huh. myself, and I would listen to the podcast. And I remember literally stopping and going, oh, this is a TV show. But, so the show um, was a true story about two women in their 50s who discovered that they were switched. And I remember that story. Even though they were in their 50s, it upended their entire sense of identity. Yes. And I remember thinking, okay, if they're teenagers and they're living at home and they're already going through this crazy sense of identity, that would be an amazing family show that would deal with nature versus nurture and, you know, what makes a parent. And so remember, I was pregnant and I had an 18-month-old. Yeah. So I was feeling like, what if someone came in and said, oh, that's not your son. I'm taking him away. And here's this other child that you don't have a relationship with that has been lost to you. I thought, oh, I felt that in my gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I knew it was a good story. And I was really upset when my agent said, the only place he'll even hear it is ABC Family. But you know what? You only need one. I know, and but you but you know you have to play the numbers game because usually you pitch a bunch of times to sell. Yeah. So I happened to know the executive because we had gone like a little bit. We'd gone to she's younger than me, but we I knew her from my high school, and then she'd gone to my college. But we didn't really know each other. But we'd kind of. Hmm. And I remember I was eight months pregnant. I went in, and uh, she didn't have one question. She was like, "Thank you." That was great. And I walked out going, ugh. So you didn't know in the room? Oh, no. I she's she thinking hated it. sold. Exactly. Well, well, I've it. talked to her about it many times since. And I, I remember my agent called me. I was at Insomnia Cafe. <laughs> and I went outside to take the call. It was really loud on Beverly Boulevard. And I said, it went terribly. That's why I didn't call you. And she said, well, that's strange because you just bought it. And I was like, what? Wow. And she th th and broke the executive. So I said, I didn't have any questions because you've answered everything in the room. She's just she's just one of those executives who's hard to read. So, because um, it's not just the switch to birth. It's right. also the whole death right. thing. Like, how did you... That came later. So I just sold switch to birth. 
and um, I had my baby. And I was just so excited to write it. So we were kind of, it's cable, so it's off season. You Mm -hmm. know, networks have a very firm... I'm watching it on Netflix, so I have no idea when it even comes on. Right, exactly. just waiting for the next season to come on Netflix. It's coming on in January. Oh, thank you. Um, So uh, they were, I had just missed the season, but I didn't care. So in January, when my daughter was like, you know, like six to eight weeks old, I just took her to this cafe and I'd write and nurse her and write and nurse her. And um, it was just actually this very lovely memory. And I turned in the first outline and Brooke said, um, I don't know, I was thinking like, what if, you know, the rich family um, was feeling upset because their bio kid had some sort of disability and she suggested something in a wheelchair or something. And I had this sort of connection to deaf culture. I'd taken a class in college. I had read I was a bunch wondering of, what yeah, the I took a class called theater thing. of the deaf at Duke and it was a sign language theater class. Mm. So you would perform monologues and scenes in sign language. It was a very amazing class. It was wow. taught by a hearing guy who had a deaf girlfriend. And it was a very small class. And the joke is my roommate, who's my best friend, always says, like, I would take these crazy classes and everyone would say, you're nuts. You have to fulfill your requirements. Why are you doing this? And, of course, those, are the, classes, <laughs> those are the classes that, you know, turn your life around. Um, so on the phone right then, I said to her, what about deaf? And she was like... I don't know when she think about it. I think it was, you know, she wasn't as comfortable with the concept right away. And then I came back days later and I said, here's how it would work. And, you know, by the way, when we have two deaf people in a scene, we're going to have to caption Mm -hmm. pause. (laughs) And she was like, fine, great. And it was just my first kind of like, Oh, everyone tells you, Oh, network TV. They're so scared. I I was afraid they were going to say, People won't read. We right. can't do that. And then I was going to be not authentic because deaf people, you know, they don't voice when they're alone together. Yeah. And the ABC family was great. They were like, cool, do it. So it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. It was very brave. Um, the network was really just changing. It was, you know, under this new leadership or of Kate Jurgens, they were just, yeah, taking great chances. And, um, and Brooke Bowman, they just, they were doing good stuff. So. Well, thank goodness they did. I mean, it, it's so, to me, anyway, it's one of those shows that kind of just changes everything. Like, just to get that insight into the deaf culture changes everything. I yeah. mean, what a shift in perspective and how you look at the world. I and mean, my kids are now looking up on YouTube and how to sign stuff and are so interested in the whole thing. It just opens up a whole it is, world. It was fascinating. Two things. One, in general... Um, and then, you know, it took me a while to get on social media. My, you know, when the show first started, I had this initial reaction, like someone over the age of 30 of, Oh, Twitter, I don't get it. (laughs) And I, I began to really enjoy the, uh, experience of interacting with people and fans and I grew to really like it. And I was really touched by over the past five years, how many people have reached out to me and saying, you know, my daughter has either, either she's deaf or has a different disability. And it's so incredibly powerful to have her see herself on screen. Yes. And so that I just feel so great about. And I feel like, wow, we, we ended up doing a really wonderful thing. And then in particular, in specific, um, just deaf culture and sign language is really just people, they love it. You know, yeah. they find it fascinating. Like you said, your kids. And um, I'm just completely passionate about it. I teach sign language every week to my daughter's class. Which is oh, so funny did. because I'm not fluent at all. But um, I'm close friends with the sign master on the show, and he helps me sort of put together a lesson, and I have the app, you know. Yeah. And I just, I think for kids it's so great because it's interactive. It's not them sitting there. Mm-hmm. They get to do it, you know. Um, I love sign language. It's just so cool. So how, how did you set up your writer's room? Ah, um, well, it is funny that you, when you asked, was that pretty much, I did go from baby writer at age like 25 to one lady. job, to one job that I didn't like, that I was kind of disconnected from for a few weeks, and then we went on strike. To being the showrunner, yeah. Um, I guess you know I had really taught myself for you know the experience of writing so many pilots by myself it was the equivalent of being in a room for so many years. I had broken story so many times. I knew my characters really, really well. Um, I was really lucky because they gave me um, a co-showrunner who was a non-writing EP. Who's um, and honestly, I've lucked out really a couple times in my life. My roommate from college, from when I was freshman, who I was handed, like literally matched mm-hmm. up with as my best friend, and Paul Stupin, who they kind of just like 
meet him for an hour and see you like, I, you know, you don't really know in an hour. And I was like, he seems fine. I don't know. <laughs> and we ended up getting, you know, work married, you know, yeah. and becoming partners. And he's just this incredible guy who has had much more experience than main TV. He was on Dawson's Creek and mm. he was an executive, you know, on that, the original 90210. So he had that breadth of experience. Um, but he was just perfectly comfortable also like letting me do, you know, creative stuff. And he was just this amazing partner. And, uh, so is he doing more of the operations and yeah, you're doing the creative? Exactly. Um, we overlapped on stuff. Like we both would approve costumes and sets and the editing room. We were both in the editing room. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the writer's room was kind of my domain. And then I would always hire a strong number two. That was my other sort of secret weapon. Um, I always had these and they were both women. I had two number two. It was one for two years and one for three years. Um, and what was the demographic of the room? How many writers? Um, how many men? How many women? Okay, so the, in the beginning, it changed a lot. Yeah. But the original group was me, Becky, who was my number two, and then there was a team of two guys. Oh, wow, two other single guys. And then, was it only one other woman? Um, was it just Joy? I'm blanking on someone. Oh, my God, it's been so long. So there were like eight of us. And Paul kind of bopped in and out. Like, he definitely would comment on stories, but he had other responsibilities. He would book directors and go to budget meetings. Mm -hmm. um, we really had a, a sort of a great separation of labor, <laughs> division of labor. Um, and we just, I don't know, we had a blast. We really did. I, you know, the writers would always tell me at least, like, horror stories of other rooms and really toxic environments, either because from the top down there was, you know, I don't know, craziness or, or ego or politics. And I just really wanted to have a good time and just do the work, just do the work. And although I did say, so I had a one-year-old and a three-year-old when the, the show was greenlit to series. Okay. Let's talk about that. Yeah. How do you manage that? Well, that's the, honestly, I mean, I give, I credit to Paul. Um, my husband was great. And of course, just like Shonda Rhimes says, and a nanny. Um, and also just, I, I was very, um, we're going to start on time, mm -hmm. and we're going to end. And, you know, I, I'd heard about rooms in which, like, the show mourner would, like, sh like spend a lot of time in editing or on set and kind of bop in at five and be like, let's start our let's, day. <laughs> or, like, show me what you've done. I'm throwing it all out. And I really wanted to get home. And yeah. I had an hour commute. Yeah, we shot in Santa Clarita, which is um, 35 miles north of yeah. here. Um, so there was a big old commute, and I, I just didn't... I was like, we're leaving at a hard out. I mean, I really left at like 5.36 every day. Oh, well done. Yeah. We'd have about one late night a season, because either the network would, you know, throw something out. Early on, earlier on in the first or two seasons, they were more kind of on us. And then with success, they were a little more like, you do your thing, we, we trust you. Um, but really we only had dinner together one time a season and I just, I would do work when the kids went to bed, but I, I was really present. I just you wasn't did that real to... efficient. I did. It was a mother, a man, I'm out, do the work, mm -hmm. get home. Yep. Beautiful. And you know, t you know, set can really be a time suck mm -hmm. if you let it. I was on set, I think more in the first season just to, you know, I had very particular tastes, right? The showrunner defines the taste, right? And I, like I would, I became famous for saying like, I don't want a hug unless it's earned. So honestly, the writer on set would call me like, they want a hug. Is that okay? Because I felt like, you know, with this kind of show, you can tip over into saccharin really mm -hmm. fast. So I just wanted, I always made sure like, okay, it has to be earned. But that's just the stuff in the beginning that I was there for. And then I was just not on set that much in later seasons because honestly, the way set is, you know, you're like, you'll run on set and they'll be like, oh, great, you're just here, perfect timing. Oh, just... Actually, just kidding. A light broke, mm. and it's another forty minutes, and you're, and then you've missed your kids. Yeah. So I, I just didn't go on set unless I really needed to, and we were lucky because we shot down the hill from the writers' room, so we never, I was never out of town. Yeah. That's a big deal, yeah. and that was not, that was just luck. We you didn't, didn't have any control over that. No, they just told us um, Santa Clarita Studios is where we're going to be shooting. The writers' room is going to be right there. Did you get the incentive? Uh, yeah, we did. We got good tax breaks. Um, no, I had nothing. They, when they gave me the show, it was, and here you, here is your Santa Clarita studio. So um, you could have been in New Mexico for all the control. Yeah. You at that point. Yeah. And what's funny is, you know, we used to complain about the drive, <laughs> but actually in later years I was, you know, savvy enough to realize, but I'm not in Vancouver for two weeks at a yeah. time. I was home for dinner every night or not dinner, but I was home to put them in bed every night. Yeah. So that was quite lucky. 
Um, but uh, no, switched it. You know, it was, it was really just quite a magical, you know, a lot of stuff was kind of came together, was lucky. Paul and I are just very kind of like not yellers, you know. Um, I don't know. We just created, I, I hope, an environment that was, we laughed every day in the writer's room. I think that's so important um, to leave. You have to, you know, to be creative for eight hours is very hard. Yeah. And so you have to leave room for a little bit. On the one hand, as I said, I, I don't want a ton of it because I want to get out of here. But you do have to leave a little room for like, oh my God, what's going on with Beyonce? You know? <laughs> um, Where people can be free. Yeah. Now yeah. you're talking about it like it's over. Is it over? Oh, it's over. Yeah. Okay, so there's one more season. There, we have 10 more episodes that are going to be aired in January. But we were canceled a few okay. months ago. We're yeah. We prepare ourselves yeah. for that. I know. We, we will have had 103 and a half episodes. And a half? Yes. The series finale, they offered me a 90 minute or a two hour finale. Oh, good. So I get, took the 90 minute. I feel like two hours would have had kind of fat on it. Just wanted to be lean and so, yeah. All we right. have a, a series finale. It's 90 minutes. It's, it's quite sad. I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So when did you wrap that? We wrapped in April, I think. Okay. Wrapped in April, and then Paul and I have a like a month of editing, or you know, kind of popping in and out, and then I, I yeah, it's it's not my reality anymore. So what's next for you? Well, I'm out there pitching right now. I'm pitching, you know, one network show, one cable show, and one that I, we could be either, but will probably be a cable show. Um, and so that's, you know, pitching is a job, it's a semi full-time job. And you haven't pitched in a while, I imagine. Or have um, you been pitching the whole time? I've been pitching the whole time. First of all, I did do a pilot while I was at ABC, for ABC Family. I, did, I wrote another one while, actually I wrote two. So yes, I, I <laughs> did one for ABC Family while I was running the show and I sold one to the CW last fall because we got picked up late and I wasn't like, I was pretty sure we were going to get picked up for season five, but they hadn't guaranteed us. Mm. So I sold a pilot just to be sure that I'd have something. So I have been pitching and I would pitch every week to the network. I mean, you'd really do have to pitch them the episode every week. So I, the pitching, so the pitching never ends. It never ends. I mean, it's a little bit different when you're like, okay, episode 77, here's generally what it is from like, here's a world, here are the characters. Yeah. That of course is a ton more work. Um... But yeah, you know, look at it. it's it's changed a lot. I mean, it's it's a lot more. I mean, you know, everyone's bringing in. Um, I mean, posters and there's ten people on a pitch going in. There's directors attached and five producers. It's, it's They're a, getting more elaborate. They are dramatic. It is. Well, I'm getting the sense though that you're prolific. So yeah, I guess I am. You've got a whole bag full of ideas. I do, I do, <laughs> I do. I'm excited for the next thing myself, personally. Um, tell me this, as you're going in, are you finding now, because there's a lot of buzz about everyone's looking for female-centric products or female-led projects. Is, mm-hmm. is that true, or is that just people talking? Well, okay. I mean, so one of the projects is a true story based on this incredible, Incredible woman who, um, German Jew, became the, uh, America's first crime boss in New York City at the turn of the century. What? 300 pounds, six foot one, smart as a whip. And what I love about her is that she had everything against her. She was a woman, she was Jewish, she was fat, she was, you know, everything, immigrant. Like, I'm wondering, did she dress like a man? Like, how, she, <laughs> how did this happen? She worked her way up. She was so smart. She had basically a ton of people working for her. She was the, a crime boss, you know? And she, she, but she ruled as a woman. They, she was called she was Marm Mandelbaum. She was, yes, that's our title. She, she was, and Marm means mom in German, I'm pretty sure. So they just called her Marm, but then her name was Frederica. And it's this incredible story with all of these characters. And it, Paul um, and I are, are pitching it together. He's the one who found this character. And I've encountered a lot of, you know, oh, time period is hard, but it's not hard when it's men. That's what I've found. You know, there's period stuff everywhere. There's periods of everywhere. And I will read about the exact same network who just said, oh, I'm so sorry. We won't even hear that. And they just bought something that like is in the same time period, but with a man. And it's, you know, there's some weird. So it's the double whammy of a woman protagonist and history that there. There's still well, you can't stuff have like both. That. One no, or the right, other. exactly. Pick one. Um, that's been frustrating. Um, 
and hmm, the female showrunner. Yeah, I mean, look, should they pick a show up just because it's run by women? No, but I don't. Really, I, I don't. Know. That's a very tricky question. When we get into all of these, it is because you know, how do you know? It's hard to pinpoint. But I, I'll, I will tell is. you a story. Um, so when I first started the show, as I said, Paul's, Paul, Paul's, you know, had his sort of things that he loved doing and he loved, um, booking the directors and he had a bunch of people he'd worked with over the years and he's older. And the first thing I said was, I want a lot of women. I don't know if we're going to get to 50, 50, but I want a lot. And so that we'd always done that. And, and he was great about, sure, let, let's start doing that. But I hadn't been as aware about diversity. I just, I don't know, it wasn't on my radar and some, some of the women were diverse, but it wasn't a specific mandate of mine like women was. And then about a year ago in our last season, the Oscars so white yeah. that, and there was just a lot of pressure within Hollywood and the network said to us, you guys have to start hiring more diverse directors. And at first, just like anyone, we were sort of, you know, defensive, but we don't, you know, we love our directors and we're going to say no to them. And we have a bunch of women and some of them are diverse already. But like they, how, how many women had you gotten? Um, well, we always were, we had, um, episodes that were in tens. So mm-hmm. I would think of it, we'd have 10 at a time. I bet we had four out of 10 every time, you know, once or twice we had five out of 10. We'd had half and half. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, we had Leah that like, so we had an actress on our show, Leah Thompson, so sometimes we'd have in, you know, in-house. We gave a shot to this woman director who I think, um, excuse me, editor, who really wanted to be director. So we had sort of internal people and then we let them in. But anyway, when the network pressured us, they said, listen, we're going to start sending you some diverse candidates and you should start looking. And what happened was once they forced our hand, I loved them. Yeah. And I met them and I thought, oh my God, I want to work with this person. And we hired them and now I want to work with them again. And so my point is I'm a big believer in getting a little nudge. Yeah. I mean, even I, who's a woman, it was, a, I guess, a blank spot, and I needed a push, and once I got that push, I'm so glad. And, I, and now I feel like it encouraged you to tell more stories that, you know, di- these diverse directors will connect with, and I just, we had a great experience. So I, I do think that sometimes little pushes are necessary. For sure. Yeah. Now, I'm curious... Because the way you're talking about diversity, I'm assuming ethnic diversity, yeah. not gender. Right. Were you finding then the diversity with both genders? Or were you yeah. already... Did I already have... Oh, I had a ton of men and women. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'd always had both. That was never a problem, getting men and women. Yeah. I mean, I think there's more of a problem in comedy. Mm-hmm. I know that, Well, women actually. are funny, so... Right. Well, no. So what happened was, so a, a, a good friend of mine um, is a showrunner of this new show in comedy, and I... He called me about a recommendation for our line producer. And I said, well, listen, while I have you, I'm going to just give you my push for both diversity and women. And he said, oh, of course, of course, we're absolutely doing that. It's actually really, really hard to find senior women in comedy who are available. And he said, there's a lot at the lower level. And I was like, you know, that's because 10 years ago, they they weren't as welcoming. And now in 10 years, there will be a lot of senior women in comedy. Mm-hmm. But it was it was a cold world ten years ago for women in comedy. Yeah, but in drama, it's it's I think pretty good. Yeah, yeah. For my experience, yeah, it seems to be the the women I'm talking to. I'm talking to a lot of women mm-hmm. showrunners. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That and and my network was just very very welcoming to women showrunners. ABC Family did a lot of that. Yeah, great. Yeah. Now, what about? Do you have a sense that you are paid equally to men in your position? Interesting. Um, well, it's funny, you know, I was at a cable network, so it was always an awareness that I probably wasn't getting paid as much as network. Um, I think I'm paid okay. I think um, I have a great agent. And they're negotiating. They're, yeah. I, and he happens to represent like all, a ton of like all these women um, writers and directors. So I feel like, I mean, I guess I'm just sort of trusting because. I'm not, listen, I'm not getting the calls a million times a day from business affairs knowing what men are making, so it's really hard to know. It actually, you know... What about you're sending at, you the list? <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, we were, you know, when writers, we didn't negotiate the contracts for writers, but we had to, it's sort of interesting. When you're the showrunner, the agent makes the deal with the network in business affairs, mm-hmm. but they kind of have to clear it with us, like, are you guys willing to take this much money out of your budget? And if we lose the writer, 
over this amount of money are you going to be okay with it so we we had like a factor but it wasn't quite like we're the ones you're you not know. in there making the deal no um but I said we had to approve it so I got to see a little bit of men versus women um but you know in my experience it wasn't all it wasn't really this is a very limited experience of our show and our network it was more just like at that time and place where we desperate to keep that writer yeah and it didn't matter if they were a man or woman I was just like I'd call business writers. I'd be like, I cannot lose this writer. This money's year. no object. Make it, make it happen. We, I couldn't say money's no object, but I'd say don't blow this deal over a couple thousand dollars a week. I need this writer, and I loved my writers, so yeah. I would mostly say that. You know, um, yeah, but I don't, I don't really know. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not something I see every day, like how much everyone's making. Yeah, but I feel like I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, your house is beautiful. Thank I'll you. Say that. Thank um, you. And is your husband in the business too? No. No, doing? my husband um, is in market research, so he runs focus groups for, he did a lot of video game work, he actually worked for a bunch of, you know, um, Discovery Channel sort of testing, you know, in different markets, so he had a lot of travel when the show started. So getting back yeah, to the question yeah, yeah. of, right, so when the show started and we had a one-year-old and a three-year-old, he had a pretty big job, and he was on the road a lot, and it was crazy, but you know, I didn't... It's funny, you know, I, I had this very, I look back and I was like, how could I not have known it was going to go on and we were doing so well, but you know, I'm this, you know, neurotic Jew in some ways. I was like, I don't know. I don't want to make any big changes. Um, so we just kind of lived with it. And then after a couple of years, we were like, wow, this really isn't working. The kids, we found that when the kids were babies, they actually needed less of us than they do now mm-hmm. when they come home from school and they need to talk about stuff and yeah. there's... But when they're babies, it felt like the nanny could do more of the sort of diaper changing and, and picking them up from preschool. It's manual labor at that yeah, point. Yeah. It really, yeah. So he basically pulled back. Um, and Pulled uh, back from the travel? Yeah. He pulled back a lot from the travel. And then in the last year, like a ton, because, it, you know, the job becomes, as I said, actually, I think the job was the same. The kids require more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Then have you have you guys then consciously negotiated home responsibility and kid responsibility and work responsibility in a way that feels really like we're consciously creating totally our life? I mean, getting into my husband's stuff, but yeah, I mean, right now, now we're going to change again because, of course, I'm, I'm not running a show. But he became the stay-at-home parent for... Well, he's been doing it for about six months. We had a nanny in the afternoons for a while while he was doing freelance. And then she left to find a full-time job. And he just decided to take it on himself instead of hiring someone else. So for a while we had... I wouldn't even say that untraditional because in LA there's so many couples like this. Yeah. I mean, every at our school, there's a ton of stay-at-home dads. Um, for whatever reason, it works out better in their family. Um, and now we're probably switching again. He'll probably get a job soon and... I'm going to be, you know, writing from home at least for the next six months until either another show goes or something. But we have to keep renegotiating because the life of a writer is is just, you know, to have five years on Switch was great, but you don't know at the beginning it's going to be five years. Right. So you have to every year reassess. Um, yeah. So we, we figure it out as we go. It's hard. Yeah. I think it requires a lot of talking. It's hard. And, um, you know... Every family has to figure it out. Every has, yeah. But it is great if you're in a place and in your school, if there's a network of support yeah. and a lot of people in the same boat. Yeah, I mean, everywhere we go, as I said, we're not living in, I don't know, some state where that would seem so strange. Yeah. You I know. mean, my school is full of writers. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of it going on. Yeah, exactly. Are you a success? Ooh. Um, Gosh, now I'm trapped as a woman because you can't Like, say, really? You're pausing? No, I'm <laughs> pausing on... Well, yeah, you're pausing on how to answer that diplomatically, you know? I, I mean, I feel... My first thought, honestly, was I'm a success because of all of those emails and moments that I've gotten on social media, people saying, I love the show. And I've shared a couple, you know, in speeches and stuff, but... You know, the, the ones that mean the most to me that make me feel like a success are like this one, some woman wrote, I had a baby and my sister came to visit me the day after I delivered and we sat in the hospital and watched your show. I was like, oh, oh my God, like 
that's a memory. That's like this lovely, cozy memory that they have. Or they like, and I know that feeling of watching a show you love with someone you love. Mm. And I'm like, oh, I gave that little bubble of a moment to someone. Or, you know, as I said, someone saying like, if you saw what this meant to my daughter who's deaf and to see a deaf protagonist every week who's pretty and cool and flawed and it has changed her perception of herself, that honestly, it, that's where I feel like I've done good. That's huge. Yeah. It's like you're touching people's lives and you probably don't even know the half of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, it's, it, and so I've always said, I don't know if it'll ever happen again. You know? It's funny. When I went to the Blue Crush premiere and my parents came... There were like a thousand people. I mean, it was one of those old schools. At Universal, it was massive, massive. There's a red carpet. Big Hollywood premiere. Big Hollywood premiere. And I was, as I said, I was like 29 or something. You made it. And I said to my parents, just so you know, this may never happen again. <laughs> and so, and you know, now I'm saying about this show, I don't know if I'll ever have a show again that wins a Peabody that has you know, an entire, you know, a bunch of people saying it's my favorite show. And even though it doesn't have the same budget or glamour factor of, you know, shows on HBO or network, it's my personal favorite show. I, I'm so like pleased that I got to do one that could, people could love like that. I'll try to do it again, but you got to just be honest about, you know, how many times can you, but do something different, do something different, you know, you just never know. You never know. Sometimes lightning strikes again. I hope so. I hope so. Are you a badass? Yeah. Huh. Interesting question. That word doesn't seem to connect with me. I mean, I feel confident. I feel like if I could run a show overnight and that feels like, okay, I know what I'm doing in the sense that you could throw something at me and I can figure it out. Badass is, I don't know, implies like leather and chains or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not sitting as, yes. That's yeah, I don't know. You know, as a woman, badass, does it mean you go in and tell people the way it is? I, I don't know what that means. That, yeah, that phrase isn't, isn't, I'm trying it on and doesn't seem to be the right size. <laughs> <laughs> that's a perfect way to say it. Um, what is your sense of where women are in this industry at this point in time? Um, well, as we were talking about, the behind the scenes numbers aren't great for networks and showrunners. Um, I still think the taste, there's still a lot of old school stuff. You know, there's mm. a lot of, um, look, it's pervasive in the everywhere. And I think it's just seeping in. There are a lot of women executives in TV, but there's a lot of, um, look, I mean, diversity, it really took... I mean, I thought that movement was fantastic. Oscar is so white. It was, it was shaming in a way, you know, but... And then look at the Emmys. So different. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to answer that question in general. Um, you know, unfortunately, there, there seems to be right more of a fear of, oh, you know, women-led shows in history. We, we don't do that. People, you know, men seem to watch history. And it's like, well, maybe if you put on a show about a woman history, women would watch it. Maybe that's why they're yeah. not watching. It's like you're not putting us at center stage. Let's give it a try. Yeah. Um, they're not all war movies. It's also, you know, I, I was reading an article that I respond to that there's a lot of rape on TV mm -hmm. um, that's used a lot. And look, we, we did assault on our show. Um, we talked about it ad nauseum every which way. We had, you know, rape survivors in the room. And, and you did it in such a complex layered way that Thank I you. thought was so great. Thank Especially because my kids were so obsessed with it. I was like, look at all sides Well, what I, what I would say about that is I have a son and a daughter. Yeah. And so I come at it with that perspective, which is, look, at the guys are people too. We can't make them out to be villains. Let's figure out what's going on in their head. Doesn't mean that every choice that every guy makes is right, but I just wanted to make sure it was a full, complete human and experience that felt right to what happens in a lot of college. It's not quite the black and white of he held her down. I mean, that, you know, those are very clear. And I really wanted it to be um, a situation in which it would tell boys, you better get consent yeah. because it will ruin your life too. It will definitely ruin the girl's life, but let's also talk about how it could ruin yours. And you need to get explicit consent from someone who's sober. You know, that was, a, it was a very specific thing we were talking about, yeah. you know, consent, which I had never seen before. And it wasn't, when I was in college, there wasn't that issue. So I really thought, okay, this is a problem, the alcohol in college, and let's, let's really get into consent. Um, 
you know, our, you know, what was the question? How, are, are we equal? What was it? I think it was a, what's the state of women in the business right now? You know, pushing forward, pushing forward, change, change, change goes in spurts, right? It's slow and it's fast. It feels to me like this is a, the year when suddenly everything's just becoming transparent. Even if things aren't changing greatly, mm-hmm. everybody's talking and kind of ripping the veil. Yeah, talking about, and I do think, look, and I'm not an executive inside network, so I don't know how much they care about the report cards. But when they publish, okay, of the 30 shows that were picked up by network, only three are, you know, created by women. I don't know. Does, do the networks go, oh, gosh, we need to change that? Or are they like, well, that's what happened. Sorry. I think it depends on the network. Yeah. But I think it helps a little. And as I said, I think that pressure pushed ABC Family in a good way. So I think for some people it's, hey, you know, the world is diverse. We need to be telling diverse stories and having it run by diverse people. So I think that message is is getting out there. And social media can be awesome. It also can be terrible. But social media can pressure people a lot. For sure. Well, and now uh, the Gina Davis Institute is putting out all the data so then that's really hard to argue with. Yeah. When all the data is in front of you. Okay. Then you make a choice. Right. Do you want to make it different or not? Right. 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 That that kind of pressure is great. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you read, do you read Lenny, which is the... Yes. Okay. Did you read that one today? No. There was an essay written by Jenny Connor saying that something very upsetting happened last night where they were out somewhere and this drunk director kind of pulled them aside and said, oh, you show your tits. Can you... Um, encourage this actress of mine to show her tits. It was that kind of graphic and missing the whole point of what Lena is yeah. doing when she sh- when she gets naked. And they were they were sort of pointing to wow, this still happens. This kind of missing the boat, and that's not what this is about. And Completely missing the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had, of course, my experiences. You know, one or two of of that. Um, I've also you know had experiences of women not being great to me, mm-hmm. but not a ton. Not a ton of those, to be honest. I, it's not like I, I have any kind of baggage about women, but just a couple. But women you know. are people. Yeah. So, and sometimes there's, you know, put downs. But I've had mostly great experiences with women. So, uh, you know, I, I had an experience where um, years later, uh, this woman producer told me on this movie, oh, this other guy producer assumed you were hired because, you know your body or that you were having an affair with the director or something. Oh, so, something that was like so insulting. Yeah. So insulting. Like it didn't, he just, he was an older guy and he sort of assumed, Oh, young woman in her twenties. I'm assuming that was part of the equation to why she was hired. Like, it, like it, that's all you were bringing to it the It pissed table. me off. It pissed me off. Yeah. For sure. But you just kind of shrug it off and. I'll show you fella. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I guess I did. <laughs> yes, I think you did. What would you tell a young woman coming up now? Hmm. As a writer? Or yeah. just Yeah, that want to be writers. Um some advice that would be Yeah, we just want the good advice. I know. <laughs> well, you know, everyone's path is so different. And I did have now I know quite an unusual path, and I know that because everyone in my writer's room has gotten where they are by climbing the ladder, right? right? They enter as either a, you know, a PA or a writer assistant or an assistant to the showrunner. They get an entree into the room. They get a freelance. They get a staff writer job. Boom, boom, boom. They go up the ladder. And that wasn't my experience. I didn't have that. And and my experience was mine. And I guess, you know, whatever, whatever your path is, is your path. You just keep pushing forward and... I really did just keep writing and keep writing um, in order to hone my craft. And if I, that, that worked for me. You know, it worked to, so that when I was handed the opportunity, you know, I was like, great, I'm ready because I've been exercising at home every day, you yeah. know? Um, but there isn't really one path. That's what I'm hearing that is so different is you didn't write one script and then hold on to it for 10 years waiting to be picked. No. You did it and did it and did it and did it and did it. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I was pitching movies all the time, you know, and so that, that experience isn't terrifying to me and I've been doing all that and, um, yeah, every year, okay, what, what's, what am I going to sell this year? You know, and I was given properties and stuff to pitch on, but I think as a writer, the one, okay, I mean, I can, this is a more writing than, more than a how to make it, mm-hmm. but you really do have to find the way in that you're passionate about. 
Um, it's always funny to me because I don't watch anyone else pitch, right? I'm not an executive or a producer, so I, the only pitches I'm in are my own. Yeah. Um, so you know how you pitch. Exactly. So I, I, I'm always kind of curious, but people often say to me, oh, you're so passionate about this idea. It's so great. And it sort of surprised me, like, well, isn't everyone... Yeah, how else would you do it? How that? else would you do it? And... Yeah, I got this thing. You probably won't like it. <laughs> no, but it, I think it, not quite as extreme as that, but... I always, like, if I'm given something and I think, oh, at, it'll take me a couple days. Oh, this is what I'm excited about. Like, I didn't, this is what I'm interested in exploring. Now I can find a way in that I can passionately say, okay, if you give, you know, it, it's more like when you're given a book or something. Um, oh, this is an opportunity to, like, week to week talk about this. That's mm. cool. Find the thing that you're excited about. Um, you know? I mean, I was meeting with a writer a, a, a last week who I might be supervising, and a young a young woman, and it was it was just encouraging her to. She'd been through a lot of drafts and a lot of notes process, and I could see because I've been there that you your brain is spinning. You've got ten files. You tried it this way. You tried it that way, and I just encouraged her to like step back, get in a quiet place, turn on the unconscious side of your brain. Like when I do it, I don't. I use capitals for punctuation. It helps my flow. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of write about like, this is what I'm excited about. This is what I find fascinating. Not structure, not, you know, act two, act three, but just kind of the like impulse of that would be really cool. And to once you reconnect with that, then you go in and you figure out what the, you know, act one, act two. So find the structure after you found. Yeah, for me, I really have to reconnect with why did I, what am I excited about, you know, Blue Crush, what, if I were to do it again today, what would be the new thing that I'd be like, oh, this is a really cool way to explore this, hmm. you know? So, you know, if in 10 years I'm asked to do a reunion for Switch to Birth, I'll have to figure that out. I'll have to figure out what am I excited to talk about that's going on in the world with these characters who are now 10 years older. What am I experiencing that they and Daphne could be experiencing now that they're, you know, 30 that I'd want to talk about? Because what will their kids turn out to be, and how will that relationship be? Yeah, would you please yeah. do it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, hopefully they will be fun to well, do and a reunion. With Netflix now yeah. that they have all the data, know what people are watching. They're doing all the reunions. I love it. Like I can't wait for Gilmore Girls. I know, I know. That's so great. So you just kind of well, one thing that and this is the you know last thing, but I remember people used to ask me like, did you know? Did you plan out? Like I planned out the first ten episodes because there was a big twist, you know, on the first mm. ten with Regina. And all that, but there's no way that I think you can plan out a hundred episodes because, first of all, it's a living, breathing thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, TV is is really is. It's not a novel that's kind of your own control. I mean, there's chemistry, there's actor problems, you know, bad actor, you know, behavior. There's um, people who come in who you fall in love with, who you're like, oh, I want to write for this person a lot. Um, and then there's people who you are like. Oh, I mean, I discovered that Leah Thompson could sing. I didn't know that. I love Leah Thompson's voice, and yeah. I just find opportunities to have Leah sing. Or and then singing together is so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Or just you know, look at Lucas as an amazing dancer. How come you know? How can you possibly before you cast, and then even after you cast, how can you possibly arc out what the world's going to be like? I mean, the campus assault story. Mm-hmm. I didn't know when I wrote you know wrote the pilot that would be a really interesting, important story to tell when the girls were in college. You just I like to think of the show as just a living, breathing organism that you kind of, you move with it in the world, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's fun. I love that. Yeah. Thanks. Is there anything else you would add to this conversation? No. I don't think so. The ending on that's good. TV's, you know, it's a living, breathing thing, TV shows. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. You've been listening to The Other 50%. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Lizzie Weiss for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jonathan Lucas for editing, Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features and bios of our guests. Thanks for listening. See you next time.